There was once a violinist named Fritz Kressler who is known for his unique musical skills. An hour before setting out to London, he stopped into a music store where the music store owner asked to see his violin. Then moments later, the music store owner disappeared and came back with two policemen who came up to Fritz and said, you are under arrest. To which Fritz Kressler said, for what? And the policeman said, because you have Fritz Kressler's violin. To which he replied, I am Fritz Kressler. And then they kind of had this ongoing debate, you know, trying to prove his identity. But after a while, Fritz Kressler knew that that wasn't going to work and that his ship was about to set sail. So he had an idea. He said, let me see the violin. So he took that violin and he played one of his most famous pieces. And then he asked them, are you convinced? To which they said, we are. See, the skill of this particular artist testified to his identity by his being able to play that violin, not just play it, but be able to do it in a certain way, testified that he was the one and only Kressler, in contrast to the non-Kresslers of the world, the people who may try to imitate his skills but never do it quite successfully. And in the same way, we see a picture of the Christian who, after he has repented and trusted in Christ and been saved and indwelled by the Holy Spirit and changed, that he has this new nature, he has this new identity, as a son of the light, as a son of God, in which we were looking at in the last two sermons. And because we've been transformed, we have the ability to be able to play that violin, to be able to live that Christian life as God intended. And now that we have the ability, both in the positional sense, we also have it in the practical sense. But then we have to ask, what characterizes Christian living? What characterizes true Christian living. And that is actually the topic of our passage today. As I said, this passage, or this book in general, was written to a church that was really healthy, one of the best portrayed churches in the Bible. Yet they still had common questions and concerns about issues like the end times, as well as just the salvation of loved ones who have perished, which is the reason why Paul needed to write to them to address these concerns to show them to abound in hope and anticipation because of their new identity in Jesus Christ. And now Paul shifts to giving moral instructions to the church. How are they to comfort one another? How are they to exhort one another in hope? And these observations are based on the church's interactions, you know, vertically between leaders and lay people, and then horizontally lay people to lay people, and, and then finally, as it regards our own personal life. And these instructions were very important because he needed to show them how to live as children of the light, in contrast to the children of darkness, the sons of the world. So he says, don't be like them. We remember that in the last two sermons. Now he's giving the church practical instructions in light of Christ's imminent return. So that he gives these instructions so Christians can refine their skills and testify to their identity in light of Christ's imminent coming. So in this passage, God outlines three responsibilities of a believer so that their life matches their testimony as children of God. Point one is that we testify to our identity as children of God by living out our responsibility to leaders. Living out our responsibility to leaders. We see this clearly in verse 12 to 13, so now if you can read with me, or yeah, read along with me. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Paul now transitions from talking about eschatology to talking about moral instructions to the church, commands to the church. And what an appropriate way to end such a great epistle with these imperatives for godly living, these exhortations, which seems to be a fitting conclusion and was even the pattern of a lot of Greco-Roman writing at the time. Paul exhorts them to do something first. Get your relationship right with the leaders. He says, respect those who lead over them. Now the word respect comes from the Greek word oida, which means to know. 
And we're talking about knowing him in like a relational type of sense. But in this particular context, he's not saying just, you know, have a relationship with them, regardless of what that relationship may look like. But he's saying, respect them. Respect those who labor over you. Those who labor have charge and give instructions. These aren't three separate groups as in like, here's one, here's one, and here's one. What he's talking about here is one particular group of people. The elders of the church. The pastors of the church. He's saying respect them. Respect them because they care for your souls and they shepherd over you. In the same way that you would respect your parents. In the same way that you would respect the government. Respect them. That is why Paul wrote to Timothy when he says, For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you might set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So these elders are the ones who work. They have many things that they need to do. They lead, they protect, they care for souls, they admonish, rebuke sometimes when they need to, yet they are to do it in a spirit of love and gentleness, never ever lording it over others. And in return, Christians are called not to be angry or resentful, especially if it's matters of church discipline, that if they are indeed doing their jobs and for the most part above reproach, respect them, submit to their leadership. Paul tells them not just to respect them, but to esteem them highly. He's saying, don't, he's not saying esteem them because they're worthy to be esteemed. He says, esteem them despite their unworthiness. The fact that they are sinners, just like all of us, but that because they are appointed by God as elders over you, respect them. But is it, isn't it true that all of us, we have this natural tendency to want to rebel? We see this in church all the time, don't we? All this rebellion. And we even see it in society all around, the spirit of rebellion against higher authority. And he's saying that we need to do this because of the model that we have in God, of the Godhead, because of the Father who leads the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit and the Son submitting faithfully to the Father. Because of that, that's the reason why we should live as we ought to live and know exactly what our role is. So how do we esteem them? That's probably what you're asking right now, right? Simply, by submitting to them. By submitting to them, by following them. That is the best way you esteem them. To show that you indeed love them and respect them. Quite a number of years ago, I had a friend, I was going to a different church at the time, and sometimes he would talk to me about things that were going on here at Grace Church, and he had a relationship with this particular pastor in which they had a pretty good relationship, but there were at times when they just didn't see eye to eye on certain issues, and they even had some minor quibbles about, you know, evangelism, how to do this, and you know, all these other issues. But despite all that, he would always tell me over the phone that I'm still praying for him that I'm still loving him, that I'm still submitting to him, that I'm allowing him to guide me. See, at the time, this was actually very impactful for me because I was still a new Christian. And because I was learning all this truth and I was at a church that was actually not that, you know, theologically sound, I would always be like debating and combating these elders and saying, you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong. And in a sense, I was not esteeming them. But this is exactly what Paul is telling us right here, is to esteem them highly. And if you know your relationship within that particular role, your, I mean your role in that relationship, then there is peace. There is peace. And that's exactly what it says right here, live at peace with one another. That is how we live at peace with one another. We see this like, you know, government and subject, husband and wife, parent and child. We need to be at peace with one another because he is telling us to all maintain the unity of the church. The unity, the love, and the testimony of the church. So even reflecting right now, are you submitting to your elders? Have there been times when you just have not submitted to them because you think that you should have it your way? 
mean, this is a, something of my past, and all of us have probably some experience in it. And maybe if you are an elder today, are you gently loving your people and not lording it over them? Are you maintaining that peace, even though you may not see eye to eye sometimes? He's telling us right here, listen to them. We are called. We all need to listen to them. We need to support them. We need to help them. Because elders need our help so, so much. And failure to do so is not only rebellion against elders, but also against God. And when there's such an attitude, there's only trouble within the church. So we should not be tearing each other down, but we should be striving to build one another up in the fellowship of God. Amongst all, each other. And that now leads to point number two, is that we testify to our identity as children of God by living out our responsibility to each other. To each other. And this is perfectly reflected in verses 14 to 15, which says, And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil. But always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Paul begins a new point right now by transitioning to the duty of the entire church. By giving these series of imperatives and commands for us to follow. Not just the elders, but the lay people in the church. And he's saying, first of all, regarding those who are unruly, which means these people are idle, lazy, that they cause divisions within the church. He says, these people, you got to admonish them. You got to, you know, straight out tell them what it is they're doing. Admonish them. Otherwise, they're going to cause divisions within the church. And there's no peace. But on the flip side of the coin, he's saying, Help those who are weak. Help those who are weak, the faint-hearted. Now, who exactly are these faint-hearted? These people who are pretty much anxious and sorrowful. These are people who um, have been distressed because of their loved ones who have gone because of the persecution. And they think that they're in the day of the Lord, just like I talked about in the last two sermons, and are not even sure about their salvation. He's saying, help them. Be patient with them. And even those who are weak. He may be talking about people who are weak in the physical sense, but I believe that Scripture is saying right here that he's talking about people who are weak in the spiritual and emotional sense. These people especially, they need our care. They are fragile. They need to be helped. And we should do this all in what? In what type of attitude? Very simply. Patience. Patience. Because you got to admit, ministry work is tough, right? It is tough. We're going to be dealing with a lot of people who are going to get under our skin. And in those moments, we have to learn what does it mean to have patience with them. Now, patience is an attribute that was you know, often attributed to God in the Old Testament in their intertestamental period, the literature, as well as it's in all of Paul's writings. That is why it is so important for us Christians to follow. It is one of the virtues or one of the fruits of the Spirit. Are you being patient with those who need that type of patience? Or are you possibly lashing out at those who you think don't deserve patience. I heard of a story of a pastor named John Chester. He's one of the graduates of the Master's Seminary. He now pastors at a church in Virginia. He told me about when he went into that church, he met a particular man who was striving to become an elder. But then within eight weeks, it became apparent that this man was not elder qualified that he did not meet the requirements of 1 Timothy 3. And then when it finally came for him to appoint himself as an elder, John Chester uh, confronted him about the issue and raised his concerns. 
even because of the fact that this man was not willing to come to these studies regarding elder qualifications. And then this man got just so irate. And then in the next few weeks, he did, what, he did a lot of things to make John's life in that ministry pretty horrible. In fact, he even went to um, the Grace Advanced people to try to get John disqualified because of four different accounts of... Well, I'm going to try to just tell you some of them. Turning over a cushion that got snagged. Replacing a battery in a clock without telling anybody. Which <laughs> characterizes him as being deceitful. But despite all this, John was patient. And this man, this elder, eventually left the church. But somebody from Grace Advance who John was working with said this to him the whole time. He said, be patient and don't do anything rash. A good leader always moves slowly. If this were to happen to us, would we have that same type of patience? I mean, if this can even happen on the elder level, just think of like the, the lay people who are always coming after the elders all the time. I mean, I've even heard like stories of death threats towards pastors and their lives were in danger. Even from some of the people here at Master Seminary. But the question is, if that were to happen to us, how would we respond? Would we be patient? Would we be long-suffering? Not saying to tolerate, not saying to agree with what they're doing or to be a pushover, but are we patient in love to do our duties as elders? And why should we be patient? You're asking, why should I be patient with him or with her or with this elder or with this other person? Very simple. Because God was patient with us. In fact, Romans 2.4 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing what the kindness, that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? In fact, we could have all been dead right now. It's a wonder that God continues to allow the world to go on as it does with people sinning every day. Because of the lies, because of all the torments of the world, because of all the lusting, the greed, the hatred. We are all just recipients of His judgment, which is eternity in hell, which He has for the unbelieving world. But because God loves us, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, born fully God and fully man, and then He died on that cross so that He could take our sins upon Himself, so that our case can be dismissed. And then three days later, Christ rose again from the dead, basically proving to the world that He was God, and that He conquered death on our behalf. And if we repent and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we will be saved. We will be made new. And this is the reason why we should be patient. Because even right now, in our Christian walk, I mean, you've you got to admit, we sin against God all the time. And God can easily say, forget you. Forget your salvation. You, you sin way too much. But even in these moments, God is being patient with us. Being so patient with us when we don't deserve it. So that we can indeed reach the point of glorification someday. This is the blessed hope of the gospel. And this gospel motivation should cause us to be long-suffering in ministry. Whether we are an elder or a lay person. Are we doing that? Is that true in your life? In fact, when you are patient, then you will not retaliate in threats, but you will do good to them. You will not repay evil for evil, which is what the next part of the verse says. Repaying another evil for evil was a typical language in the Old Testament, especially as it regards like grand scale or small scale revenge. It was clearly forbidden in the Old Testament. And Christ even said, Christ himself who suffered at the hands of his enemies. He said, I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So brilliantly captured in the life of Jesus Christ. So are you building up each other are you looking out for each other's good? I mean, within the church, you probably know a lot of people here. 
And I'm not just talking about the people who need to be rebuked because of their unruliness, but even people who are weak, who are faint-hearted, who you probably would not have much patience with because they're saying, why don't you know any better? I've been teaching this to you over and over again. He's saying these people, be patient, please. He says, just be patient with them. And, you know, I remind myself of that all the time, that I need to be reminded of that. We have to ask ourselves, are we being patient? And are we helping each other? And not repaying evil for evil within the church? Why? Because the testimony of the church is on the line. Not just because it's an act of worship to God, because the testimony of the church is on the line here. Of course, we know that none of this could ever be possible unless our own life is right with the Lord. It all stems from a heart that is right, that is filled richly with God's Word. We must get our own worship life right, which now leads to point number three, is that we testify to our identity as children of God by living out our responsibility in regards to ourself or yourself. And we see this in the last verses of today's sermon, verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Paul continues his series of exhortations, but now he's talking about their personal lives, what they are to be focusing on. First of all, he's telling them, he begins by saying, Rejoice! 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 Rejoice in moments that are good. Rejoice even in moments when you suffer. It is hard, I know, but he's saying rejoice even in the midst of persecution. We have to follow the model that even Paul laid out with his life, even if it's persecution unto death. Rejoice in those moments. Because God's sovereign hand is working in everything. Brothers, are you rejoicing in those moments? Or are you despairing and complaining to God, I deserve better, why am I in this position? Famous evangelist Tony Miano was, uh, last year he was preaching in Scotland, open air preaching to the masses, when he quoted 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and a woman pretty much ratted him out to the authorities because she was claiming that he was against homosexuals. So they brought him into prison and even set up a trial date for him. But despite this whole situation, he didn't complain to God, he didn't despair, but what was he doing? He was singing songs, hymns of rejoicing unto the Lord, thanking God for his goodness, for his faithfulness. And in the same way, do you feel that we can do the same thing in those moments? That we can sing hymns unto the Lord, knowing that God is still good, even in moments when we are thrown in jail because we have preached the gospel to other people, or because we have faithfully upheld what is right and what is wrong according to God's standard. Can we do that? And it also says pray without failing. Now there's a connection here, because even though pray without failing, it doesn't talk about one certain attitude or aspect, but we can see in this particular link that he's saying pray and rejoice. Rejoice through prayer. Rejoice through prayer. And this is something that he commands us to do at all times. Continuously, strenuously, are we praying at all times? And finally, Paul commands the church to give thanks in everything, which means in every circumstance of life. Why? Because God works out all things for his good. And we even see this in Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All of these things that I just talked about right here, especially in these last few verses, constitutes God's will for the Thessalonians. Not the totality of His will, 
but his particular will as it regards them and what they are to be focusing on. He's telling them, rejoice, pray, and give thanks in all circumstances. This is what defines Christian virtue. This is how we are to live out our identity as children of God. This is what makes a healthy, responsible Christian. Now that we have seen the relationship that goes vertically between elder and leaders, and then lay people to lay people, as well as just the relationship, how we are doing in regards to ourselves, how are we doing? How are we doing as children of God, as those who have been made into sons of light? We have, you know, as a new identity. Are we going to take this information and use it? Will you take this instruction and play that violin with glory? Maybe you don't. Maybe this doesn't apply to you because you haven't been saved. You don't have any desire for any of these things. You, you feel that you, you are not a new creature. And in this moment, I'm calling you, very simply, to repent and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know the gospel. I explained it earlier. Christ came. He died for you. took all your sins so that you can be forgiven and have eternal life. Repent and trust in Christ. And scripture says not only will you be saved, but you'll be made into a new creature. And after that, God will work in your heart so that you know how to live your life as a Christian and that you can respond to it. And if you have indeed been saved, then what I'm telling you right now is to, or I'm pleading right now, is to live out your calling as a Christian. You have been given the violin. You have the innate skills but it's all a matter of whether you can take these instructions, follow them, and that you can play the violin. Like Fritz, are we playing that violin so the world can see? Or are we just being lazy, apathetic? This is how we are to live as Christians so that we can stay alert in the light of His coming. 1 John 2.20 says, Now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. So will you live out your calling as a child of God today? You know, it's so appropriate that we ended in this last passage here in the Thessalonians series. And it is even my will for all of us just to understand how we are to live out our, our roles as elders, as even lay people and even our relationship to each other, as well as our relationship to God. So I pray that you will indeed take this knowledge and that you will use it for the glory of God, for the unity of the church, and for your own spiritual health, until the coming of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this time where we are able to just look into your word, these final exhortations that you give to the Thessalonians. And even these exhortations that you give to us, Lord, may we look at them, and even though a lot of it is difficult to follow, but we know that through your strength, we will be glad to follow it because of the Son, because of the cross, because of our eternal life, and the hope that we have. So we pray, Lord, as your coming approaches, that we will be faithful servants of Christ Jesus. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.